questions haunt every life, writes Andy Crouch. The first, what are we meant to be? And the second, why are we so far from what we're meant to be? Hello and welcome to Restoring the Soul, a podcast dedicated to helping you close the gap from what you're meant to be and what keeps you from being all that. I'm your producer, Brian Beatty. Thank you for listening. On this edition of Restoring the Soul, Michael continues his five-part series of podcasts on how shame fuels addiction. I encourage you to catch up on previous episodes that also include conversations with Michael's colleague, Kelly Gray. The statement Michael will address today in part three of the series is centered around the notion that shame tells us we can't get our needs met, and this couldn't be farther from the truth. And now without further delay, here's your host, Michael John Cusick. Psalm 139, certain segments in the Passion Translation. Lord, you know everything there is to know about me. You perceive every movement of my heart and soul, and you understand my every thought before it even enters my mind. You are so intimately aware of me, Lord. You read my heart like an open book, and you know all the words I'm about to speak even before I start a sentence. You know every step I will take before my journey even begins. You've gone into my future to prepare the way, and in kindness you follow behind me to spare me from the harm of my past. With your hand of love upon my life, you impart a blessing to me. This is just too wonderful, deep, and incomprehensible. Your understanding of me brings me wonder and strength. Every single moment you are thinking of me. How precious and wonderful to consider that you cherish me constantly in your every thought. O God, your desires toward me are more than the grains of sand on every shore. When I awake each morning, you're still with me. See if there is any path of pain I'm walking on, and lead me back to your glorious, everlasting ways, the path that brings me back to you. Again, that was Psalm 139, certain verses from the Passion Translation. Welcome back to our series, Five Ways That Shame Fuels Addiction. And I'm just going to jump right into this, and um, you may have noticed that there were some weeks that we took off in this series to insert other subjects, and part of that is I've just been thinking about what do I want to say about such a complex topic, and um, I was struggling with some of my own shame in that I tend to want to say everything that I could possibly say and everything that I've possibly known. And thinking back to the very first episode, the introduction in the series, uh, I wish that I'd taken that topic of overview and broken that down into maybe 10 different parts, because there's just so much here to digest. But as we jump into this idea that shame tells us we can't get our needs met, the very first place that I Uh, heard of this idea and understood it was in the work of Patrick Carnes when in his research with sex addicts and then later with addicts in general, he said that there were four core beliefs. The third core belief was that I can't get my needs met by depending on others. And if you're interested in the other three core beliefs, they're in my book, Surfing for God in the chapter on shame. I can't get my needs met by depending on others. And that's a core belief that is rooted in shame. As we start this conversation, I have another quote. It's a Scottish proverb that says, They speak of my drinking, but never my thirst. Never my thirst. That's a great quote for addiction. They speak of my porn use. They speak of my sexual acting out. They speak of my gambling problem, my shopping problem, my compulsive issue with needing to please people or order. They speak of that, but never my thirst. And so what we're going to be talking about is we'll take this word need and we will uh, replace it with the word thirst. And the word thirst is all through the Bible. Uh, We'll also replace it with the word longing. Psalm 38, I think verse 9 or 10, David says, 
God, all my longings lie open before you, and my sighing is not hidden from you. Well, what are the longings? The longings are the very things that he wrote about in Psalm 139. God, what I long for is to be known, for you to see the deepest part of me, for you to know me and to stay, for you to see and know the deepest part of me and not just stay, but to want me, to delight in me, to be bright-eyed as you are with me, to be present in a way that you are 100% for me. And where there's this intimacy of knowing my thoughts, my feelings, the things that I see, the things that I want. But in this, this place of Psalm 139 um, being known, there's a deep rest in the soul. And the imagery that Psalm 139 brings up in terms of this thirst is to be naked and unashamed. Genesis 2, and they were naked and unashamed, meaning... They were known. They were intimately known by God and by one another, and there was no shame. There was no fig leaf. There was no false self. There was no distance. There was no disconnection leading up to a certain point. And then in Genesis 3, the narrative says that suddenly when their eyes were open, that there was such a thing as good and evil, in other words, something other than good, their eyes were opened, and they covered themselves with fig leaves, and they experienced that first disconnect with God and one another, which, if you've listened to this podcast, that's a perceived disconnect. It's a perception and sense of separation, when in fact, uh, the scriptures teach that there is no separation. I will never leave you or forsake you. So let's jump into what are these specific thirsts and needs. And I want to assert that the first and greatest need is simply to be known and to know. Think of a coin with two sides. It's the coin of being known, if you will. And one side of that coin is I am deeply known, not just the information about my story, not just my worst fears or sins, but I am known for who I am, my, my substance, my glory, my light, as well as all the vulnerabilities and limitations. And in that being known, I can rest and I can simply be. I don't have to be a human doing. I can be a human being when I'm known and I'm not ashamed. And that's both the original state of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and it's also the calling and the birthright that we have as children of God in Christ, where there's no condemnation. We have nothing to hide because we can be completely loved. Now, it's important on this um, coin with two sides of being known to get the order right. Our human nature is to know. I remember years ago reading in the Navigator's Discipleship Journal. Uh, I have great respect for the Navigators. I've had a, a couple of wonderful opportunities to work with their staff and speak at their conferences. But in their Discipleship Journal, the mission statement, and I believe that this is at one point the mission statement for the whole ministry, to know Christ and make him known. And I copied that, and I wrote that on the inside of my Bible, and that became my passion. The problem with that, and if we want to speak in terms of biblical terms, is that if we don't include to be known by Christ, to know Christ, and make him known, then that former mission or idea of to know Christ and make him known, that can't be sustained. We will grow weary um, we will grow resentful, and I would argue that that's not even God's agenda. It's like as if God were saying, I want you to water this garden, but the well is dry. And that's not the kindness or the generosity or the mercy of God's heart if it's the God that looks like Jesus. And so this, this deep need is to be known and then to know. 
It's the idea from Thomas Merton of there's a a stream and a spring, or uh, another uh, writer farther back spoke of uh, the reservoir and the the channel, or the reservoir and the canal. That being known is really the foundation. And when First John says that we love because we have first been loved, that's really this idea. And we can all put words to that like, yeah, I love because I've been loved. But what if the whole goal of the Christian life in your life was to be loved, simply to be loved? And you might say, well, that's not going to get anything done in the world. And, you know, what about evangelism? And, And what about, and I would say, okay, valid questions, but do an experiment. Focus on just being loved, being in the gaze of divine love, being in the gaze of God is love. In him, there is no darkness at all. God is light. In him, there is no darkness at all. And one cannot be in the presence and the gaze of divine love and not become overflowing. You cannot not be other-centered when you're loved, because that's how love works. Love, very Trinitarian idea, gives itself away. But we don't naturally give ourselves away unless we've actually been loved. It's more of a defensive, self-protective response. I'll give myself away so that I will be loved. So, thirst, need, longing. I can't get my needs met by depending on others. So, here's what that looks like. If I can't get my needs met by depending on others, then I really have to either take care of myself and meet my needs on my own, or I have to find a way to get others to meet my needs, which still ultimately comes back to me. So just a couple of bullet points. Bullet point number one, shame tells us that our needs themselves, our thirsts themselves, are a sign of weakness. That our, quote, not enoughness, that voice of shame, you're inadequate, you're not enough, you don't measure up, that it actually plays out in relation to our needs. It's the uh, toughen up Protestant work ethic. Um, You know, you're needy, you're weak. If you were really strong, and hear how this plays out subtly for Christians, if you were really... Uh, a mature Christian, you wouldn't have needs. You would just trust Jesus because you can do all things through him who strengthens you. So one of the most common ways that shame plays out telling us we can't get our needs met is simply that our needs are shameful, that our needs are wrong, that our needs are somehow the very sign of deficiency. And really what this translates to Shame tells us that vulnerability is bad. Vulnerability is bad. Now, think for a moment. Um, I don't think any of us reflexively as human beings say vulnerability is a good thing. So uh, do this thought experiment. If you could pray a prayer, take a pill, flip a switch, and ask for one thing, would vulnerability be on the top 100 things on your list? Probably not. But what if vulnerability is akin to, if not the definition of humility? And humility saying, I'm trusting that vulnerability is good, as opposed to what might be the definition of pride, I'm saying that vulnerability is bad, and therefore I won't be vulnerable. See, in the kingdom of God, remember the kingdom of God is not where you go when you die. It's not going to heaven. The kingdom of God is this rule and reign and presence of God in all of his ways now. The kingdom of God is among you, within you. And so it's heaven happening here. The kingdom of God is defined by vulnerability. So blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. By the way, blessed are those whose needs are so profound 
that your stomach is empty and growling and your blood sugar is low and your thirst, well, you're dehydrated. Your electrolytes are in dangerously uh, deadly levels. And Jesus says in that sermon in Matthew 5 that that's blessed. It's vulnerability, and the kingdom idea is that self-sufficiency and no vulnerability doesn't lead to being loved. It actually leads to distance and disconnection, those previous aspects. We all know Brene Brown's work around the power of vulnerability and about how we need to name shame, and that's certainly um, really important in this journey of really striking a blow to shame, minimizing the voices of shame, and opening the way to hear the voices of love. I'll share this before I wrap up. Uh, I was talking to a dear friend. We were talking about original sin. And, you know, forgive me, these are just conversations I have and things I think about. And I said, you know, what do you believe about original sin versus more of the orthodox idea of what some people call first sin? And how do historically Christians think about this from different streams in different parts of the world, the East versus the West? And they paused and said, I'm not sure what I believe about sin, except that the consequences of it exist. But I know for sure that I believe in original vulnerability. And that thought took my breath away. Because we'll often talk about the image of God in us, and there's controversy over what that means. You know, do we essentially have a bad nature or a good nature? But the the fact of the matter is that um, God created us vulnerable to be dependent, that God created us like a baby to literally receive and to be taken care of. And very often those moments of dependency are met and that child is taken care of. And then there's other moments where uh, a child is neglected or wounded or for whatever reason, a parent simply can't be there. But there's no infant that says, oh, it's bad to be dependent. It's, it's bad for me to be in pain because of gas in my intestines and I'm crying out and wanting somebody to comfort me, that infant doesn't say that that's bad. But if that infant is not attended to over a long enough period of time, there are processes in that infant's nervous system and brain and neuropathways that they will not flourish, they will fail to thrive and that there's literally aspects of their ability to soothe themselves, to feel safe within their own body and person, that as they grow and develop, uh, there's certain capabilities and ways of relating in the world that just simply won't develop if those needs are not attended to. This becomes a pretty powerful analogy for um, how we live in this self-sufficiency and feel a sense of if I can't get my needs met and if no one's coming for me, if no one's coming to attune and to attend to my being and to my heart, then I'm just going to shut down. I'm going to not have any wants or needs. The other side of the equation, of course, is that I have deep needs and I'm going to find a way to get those met. And at that point, for a, a child, for a grade schooler, uh, an adolescent, and even into adulthood, that way of getting our needs met can be about survival. And yet, if we're to become whole persons, what helped us to survive becomes a barrier to us becoming integrated whole people where we can actually overflow. And that survival strategy becomes about getting filled up and getting our needs met, and it becomes dependent upon us. We're responsible for that. And then here's the, here's the rub with all this, and this is a good segue into our next podcast uh, about another way that shame fuels and activates addiction. If it's up to me, and if me getting my needs met is dependent on me, then I've got to be something 
more than who I actually am, and therefore I can't be known for who I really am or what I really am. I'm being known for what I do and how I perform and for how I'm responsible. And so I'm going to stop here just talking about um, that if we have shame over our needs and wants and longings and thirsts, that that in and of itself will allow shame to rule. I may just throw in an extra episode here because I want to come back and talk about our needs uh, in terms of what actually are those categories. Because I talk with so many men and women who say, I don't know what my needs and wants are. I've lived for so long by suppressing them or by trying to fulfill other people's expectations. My needs have really been about keeping other people happy. Uh, having other people stay and not abandon me or reject me, or my needs have been about um, having to achieve or accomplish. It would be very interesting to go through each of the Enneagram numbers. Of course, that speaks to the, to the deep need and to what the message actually was given. But as we wrap up this podcast, uh, take with you through your day and your week and into your future this idea that God blesses your thirsts. God um, acknowledges and celebrates the dignity of your desires. Because if you were made in his image, then um, indeed God desires. God longs and thirsts. In fact, the Old Testament tells us that God has a soul. And so as a bookend to... Psalm 139 that I read at the beginning, Psalm 38, once again, David saying, All my longings lie open before you, O God. My sighing is not hidden from you. Psalm 84, How lovely are your dwelling places, O Lord Almighty. My soul yearns and even faints for you. Psalm 63, God, earnestly I seek you. As someone in a desert, it alludes to. Psalm 42. As the deer pants for water, so my soul pants after you, O God. So thank you for listening to another episode of Restoring the Soul. We want you to know that Restoring the Soul is so much more than a podcast. What we're all about is helping couples and individuals get unstuck. You know how some people go to counseling or marriage therapy for months or even years and never really get anywhere? Our intensive programs help clients get unstuck in as little as two weeks. To learn more, visit RestoringTheSoul.com. That's RestoringTheSoul.com.